The Cube presents KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2022. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Welcome to Valencia, Spain, and coverage of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon Europe 2022. I'm Keith Townsend, your host of The Cube, along with Paul Gillum, Senior Editor, Enterprise Architecture for Silicon Angle, Enrico Signoretti, Senior IT Analyst for GigaOM. Uh, this has been a full day. 7,500 attendees. I might have seen them run out of food. This is just <laughs> uh, unexpected. I mean, they, the, it escalated. From what yeah. I understand, it went from four, capping it off at 4,000 gold. 5,000 gold, in it all finally at 7,500 people. I'm super excited for, you know, today's been a great day of coverage. I'm super excited for tomorrow's coverage uh, from the queue, but first off, we'll let the, the new person on stage take the, the first question of, of the wrap up of the day of coverage. Enrico, what's different about this year versus other QCons or cloud native conversations? I think in general it's the maturity. So we talk a lot about day two operations, uh, observability, monitoring, uh, going deeper and deeper in the security aspects of the application. So this means that for many enterprises, Kubernetes is becoming real critical. They want to, to get more control of it. And of course, you have the discussion around FinOps, around you know, uh, cost control, because we are deploying Kubernetes everywhere. And, and if you don't have everything optimized, controlled, monitored, you know, uh, costs go to the roof. I mean, think about uh, uh, deploying the public cloud. If your application is not optimized, you are paying more. But also in the on-premises, if you are not optimized, you don't have a, the, and a clear idea of what is going to happen. So capacity planning becomes the nightmare that we know from the past. So there is a lot of going on around these topics. Uh, really exciting actually. Less infrastructure, more application. That is what Kubernetes is uh, in the end. Paul, help me separate some of the signal from the noise. Uh, there is a lot going on, a lot of overlap. What are some of the big themes of takeaways for day one that enterprise architects, executives need to take home and really chew on? Well, the Kubernetes was a turning point. You know, Docker was introduced nine years ago, and for the first three or four years, it was an interesting technology that was not very widely adopted. Kubernetes came along and gave developers a reason to use containers. What strikes me about this conference is that this is a developer event. You know, ordinarily you go to conferences and it's geared toward IT managers, towards CIOs. This is very much geared toward developers. When you have the hearts and minds of developers, the rest of the industry is sort of pulled along with it. So this is ground zero for the hottest, uh, the, the hottest area of the entire computing industry right now is in this area, building distributed services, based, microservices based cloud native applications. And it's the developers who are leading the way. I think that's, that's a significant shift. I don't see the managers here, the CIOs here, these are the people who are, uh, who, who are pulling this industry into the next generation. Um, One of the interesting things that I've seen when we, you know, we've always said Kubernetes is for the developers, but we talk with uh, Anat Khan from uh, MoneyGram, who's an end user, he's an enterprise architect, and he brought Kubernetes to his front end de developers, and they, they, they kind of rejected it. They said, what is this? I, I just want to develop code. So when we say Kubernetes is for the developers, or the developers are here, where, how do we reconcile that mismatch of experience? We have enterprise architect here, I hear constantly that that the uh, Kubernetes is for developers, but is it a certain kind of developer that Kubernetes is for? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, so the, the paradigm is changing, okay? So, uh, and maybe a few years back, it was tough to understand how, you know, uh, uh, make your application different. So, microservices, everything was new for everybody. But actually, so everything is changed to a point, and now the developer understands 
you know, it, it, it's neural. So, you know, going through the application APIs, automation, because the complexity of this application is, is huge and you have, you know, 724 kind of development, uh, so, so deployment, so you have to stay always on, et cetera, et cetera. And actually to the point of, you know, developers, uh, you know, bringing this new generation of uh, decision makers in the end. So they are actually decision makers, they are adopting technology. Maybe it's a sort of shadow IT at the very beginning. So they are adopting it, they are using it, and they are starting to use the, a lot of open source stuff, and then somebody, upper in the stack, the executive says, what are, you know, they, they discover that the technology is already in place, is, uh, is a critical component, and then it's, uh, you know, uh, transformed in something enterprise, meaning, you know, paying enterprise services on top of it to be sure, con uh, support contract and so on. So it's a real journey, and these, are, these guys are the real decision makers. I mean, they are, at the base of the decision-making process, at least. Cloud native is something we're going to learn to take for granted. You know, when you remember back, remember the fail whale in the early days of mm -hmm. Twitter, when periodically the service would just would just uh, uh, crash from uh, from uh, traffic, or Amazon went through the same thing, Facebook went through the same thing. We don't see that anymore because we are now learning to take cloud native for granted. We assume applications are going to be available, they're going to be performant, they're going to scale, they're going to handle anything we throw at them. That is cloud native at work. And I think we, we forget sometimes how refreshing it is to have a, an internet that really works for you. Yeah, yep. I, I think we're much earlier in the journey. I, you know, we had Microsoft uh, on the Xbox team talked about 22,000 pods running, Linkerd, D, some of the initial problems and pain points of, uh, around those challenges. Uh, m much of my hallway track conversation has been centered around, as we talk about kind of the, the decision makers, the platform teams. And this is what I'm getting excited to talk about in tomorrow's coverage. Who's on the ground doing this stuff? Is it developers as we are, as, as we see or hear or told, or is it what we're seeing from the Microsoft example, the MoneyGram example, where central IT is kind of getting it. And not only are they getting it, they're enabling developers to, to simply de write code, build it, and Kubernetes is invisible. It seems like that's become the holy grail to make Kubernetes invisible, and cloud native invisible, mm -hmm. and the experience is much closer to cloud. So I, I think that uh, um, it's an interesting, I mean, I had a lot of conversation in the past year, is that it's not that the original, you know, traditional IT operations are disappearing. So it's just that uh, traditional IT operations are giving resources to these new developers, okay? So it's a, it's a sort of wallet garden. You don't see the wall, but it's a wallet garden. So they are giving you resources, and you use these resources like an internal cloud. So a few years back, we were talking about private cloud. The private cloud as, you know, as a, uh, let's say, uh, the same identical paradigm of, of the public cloud is not possible because there are no infinite resources or, well, whatever we, we think are infinite resources. So, what you're doing today is giving these developers enough resources to think that they are unlimited and they can uh, do automatic provisioning and do all these kind of things. So, they don't think about infrastructure at all, but actually it's there. So, IT operations are still there, providing resources to let the developers be more free and agile and everything. So, we are still in a, I think, an interesting time for all of it. Kubernetes and cloud native in general, I think, are blurring the lines, traditional lines. De development and operations always were separate entities. Obviously, it's with, with DevOps, those two are merging. But now we're moving, we're, when you add in shift left testing, shift right testing, uh, DevSecOps, you see the developers become much more involved in the infrastructure, and they want to be involved in infrastructure because that's what makes their applications perform. So this is going to cause, I think, IT organizations to have to do some rethinking about what those traditional lines are, maybe break down those walls and have these teams work, work much closer together, and that should be a good thing because the people who are developing applications should also have intimate knowledge of the infrastructure they're going to run on. 
So, Paul, another recurring theme that we've heard here is the impact of funding on resources. What have you, what have your discussions been around founders and creators when it comes to sourcing talent and the impact of the markets on just their day to day? Well, the sourcing talent has been a huge issue for the last year, of course, really, ever since the pandemic started. Interesting, we, uh, one of our, our guests earlier today said that with the meltdown in the tech stock market, actually talent has become more available because people who were tied to their companies because of their, their stock options are now seeing those options are underwater and suddenly they're not as loyal to the companies they join. So that's certainly for the, for the startups, uh, there are many small startups here, um, they're seeing a bit of a windfall now from the, uh, from the tech stock uh, bust. Um, nevertheless, skills are a long-term problem. The U.S. Uh, educational system is turning out about 10% of the skilled people that the industry needs every year, and uh, no one I know sees an end to that issue anytime soon. So, Enrico, last question to you. Let's talk about what that means to the practitioner. There's a lot of opportunity out there. Yeah. 200 plus sponsors I hear, hear, I think, is or the projects is 200 plus. Where are the big opportunities as a practitioner? As I'm thinking about the next thing that I'm going to learn to help me survive the next 10 or 15 years of my career, where, where do you think the focus should be? Should it be that low level uh, cloud builder? Or should it be at those le levels of extraction that we're seeing and reading about? I, I, think, I think that, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a good question. The, the answer is not that easy. I mean, uh, being a developer today, for sure, grants you, you know, uh, a salary at the end of the month. I mean, there is high demand. But actually, there are a lot of other technical uh, figures in, in, the, in, uh, in the data center, in the cloud, that could, you know, really find easily a job today. So, developers is the first in my mind, also because they are more, uh, they, they can serve multiple roles. It means you can be a developer, but actually you can be also, you know, with the new roles that we have, especially now with the DevOps, you can be uh, somebody that supports operation because you know automation, you know uh, a few other things. So you can be a sysadmin of the next generation, even if you are a developer, if, even if, when you start as a developer. KubeCon 2022, is exciting. I don't care if you're a developer, practitioner, a investor, a uh, IT decision maker, a CIO, CXO, there's so much to learn and absorb here and we're going to be covering it for the next two days. Me and Paul will be shoulder to shoulder, we'll, you're, I'm not going to say you're going to get sick of us because it's just, you know, it's all great information. We'll, we'll, we'll help sort all of this. From Valencia, Spain, I'm Keith Townsend, along with my host, Enrico Signoretti, Paul Gillen, and you're watching The Cube, the leader in high-tech coverage 